I'm Vinny Politan. Welcome to Closing Arguments. Great to have you with us tonight. All of us agree, right? I think all of us agree that the shooting death of Breonna Taylor was an absolute tragedy, should not have happened. Should not have happened. But no one's being charged for that. There was no crime committed, according to the grand jury, according to the attorney general of the state. So usually in cases where someone's been killed and we believe that it shouldn't have happened, there's a trial. And during the trial, we hear the facts, we hear the evidence, the testimony, we see the exhibits, and, and we come to some conclusion. And that conclusion is what, what trials are about. It's a search for the truth. We try to find out what happened and why did it happen. But all that evidence related to Breonna Taylor was really presented to a grand jury. So grand juries aren't televised. We don't get to see and hear what happens behind those closed doors. So what really happened on that day when, when Breonna Taylor was shot and killed? What was going on with this warrant? and the execution of the warrant, and the gunshots, and the gunfire. Well, this is our chance in this trial to try to gain some understanding of the truth of that day. As I said, no one's been charged for what happened to Breonna Taylor, but one of the officers there that night has been charged for being reckless in the way he was firing his weapon. But his weapon didn't strike Breonna Taylor. So here we are, you know, in court, criminal court, criminal charges, and the only person or officer facing charges for all the gunfire that went back and forth that night, one person was killed, an officer was shot, all this gunfire back and forth, the only person charged is the person who shot his gun and didn't strike anybody. Now, I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but it's just kind of weird, right? It's kind of weird that the only trial that we're having is for the guy who shot his weapon and didn't hit anybody. That being said, this is still an opportunity to understand and try to figure out what happened and why it happened. And prosecutors began today calling witnesses. We had opening statements, but um, Cody Etherton is, is, is I guess in this criminal case is the alleged victim. He doesn't get struck by, by uh, a bullet, but it's his apartment and his family's in there and there's all this gunfire going on. So he testified about the chaos that night. And I think we start to get a feel for the flavor of what was actually happening the night that Breonna Taylor died, the night that another officer got shot, and the night that chaos erupted in this apartment complex. Take a listen. So we were sleeping and um, I got woke to what um, to what was like a loud a loud boom and um, I jumped on my feet and she she jumped out of the bed as well and um, you know I kind of speak you know sped walk down the hallway uh, the hallway here. And uh, in my mind, I was thinking that for some reason, I, I just thought that somebody was trying to come into our apartment. So my instinct was to go to the front door, uh, of course, to protect, protect my family. Um, so as I made it down the end of the hall and I came out into the um, living room, dining room area, our kitchen table was here on this wall in the dining room and at right when I came out into the open um, just debris started going past my head my face um, which I pretty much knew because I mean I heard the shots pretty much knew that it was uh, gunfire coming through the wall because uh, that's what I do for a living is, is remodeling so when the drywall started hitting me in the face like I already knew uh, so I hit the floor and um, rolled back, rolled back into the hallway, went back into the bedroom, made her get on the ground. Um, there was probably maybe a 30 second pause. Um, everything got silent after the shots. Like 
I don't even remember how many shots I heard because it was just so chaotic. Um, I, I remember hearing them, but I couldn't tell you how many I heard. Like, it was all at once to me. Let's bring in Court TV crime and justice reporter Joy Lim Nakarin, who's joining us live tonight from Kentucky. I probably think you're back in New England tonight. Looks a little chilly there, Joy. Um, but let's start with the <laughs> opening. 30 degrees. <laughs> exactly. Let's start with those opening statements. Uh, what did you take away from those opening statements today? Yeah, so you heard that last part of what Cody Etherton said about the chaos, and really that captures the essence of the defense argument here. Uh, you know, the state, on the other hand, they really pointed to where the shell casings were found. Their overarching argument was that basically the officers, by and large, focused their fire in and around the target apartment, Brianna Taylor's. But then uh, Officer Hankison at the time, uh, according to the state, focused his fire uh, elsewhere, basically basically at, at the neighbors. And in fact, all 10 of his shell casings were found in the parking lot. Well, the defense didn't dispute what direction he was firing in and, and where his shell casings ended up. Rather, they asked the jurors to focus on the chaos and the confusion that was happening at the time of the incident and to consider the fact that, it, well, according to them, that Officer Hankinson's actions were reasonable and justified, Vinny. So, do, do his is he firing directly into the wrong apartment or is his or are the shots going through Brianna Taylor's apartment into his apartment is that clear yet so uh, it's not completely clear. There are shots that were shown that appeared to go from Brianna's Taylor's apartment into apartment three. That's uh, Cody Etherton's apartment, but also through uh, some glass as well that went into apartment three. But the overarching argument by the state is just that this guy was firing in, in a completely different direction than what the off other officers were doing. All right. I understand you had an opportunity to speak with Brianna Taylor's sister who was at the courthouse today. Yeah, so uh, she was in court from early this morning, and she actually appeared wearing a sweatshirt with Brianna Taylor's image on it, and it read, arrest the cops who killed Brianna Taylor. At the time, I didn't realize who she was. Uh, I saw that she was approached by a sheriff's deputy and seemed that she was asked to leave. I followed her. Uh, I learned that, in fact, she was asked to leave, and she was asked to change her shirt, and she told me that she was a sister of Brianna Taylor. Her name is Janaya Palmer. Let's listen to what she has to say about the importance of this case uh, in terms of justice for her sister. So obviously this has to be very emotional for you. How are you feeling? Um, this is very nerve wracking, but it's something that I have to get prepared for when it comes time for them to be charged for the murder of my sister. Mm -hmm. What what brought you here today? Because again, you know, the attorneys on both sides have said this case is about wanton endangerment of the neighbors. It is not about your sister. Uh, do you disagree? Um, it's somewhat, it's still considered about my sister because at the end of the day, you all shot into those people's apartment because y'all were still at my sister's apartment at the end of the day. And still, it's still connected to my sister. Do you feel like a, a conviction in this particular case, uh, again, for this wanton endangerment charge, um, pertaining to these neighbors, do you think that would be a piece of justice for your sister? I say yes and no. Yes, because at the end of the day, he still gets jail time. So when he gets out, you still can't go back to being an officer. You're no longer going to be a regular, per se, human. But then I say no because you're not getting charged for murdering my sister. You're getting charged for shooting into the walls because you couldn't see. Yeah, so clearly, you know, she feels that this case is connected to her sister, even though Vinny, of course, both the prosecution and the defense told jurors multiple times that this case is not about Breonna Taylor. Joy Lim Nakron in Louisville tonight. Thank you so much. Big week ahead in that case today, day one. Let's bring in our think tank. Joining us tonight in Atlanta, Georgia, criminal defense attorney Eklund Mercy in Los Angeles, California, former federal prosecutor Nima Romani. And in Phoenix, Arizona, uh, the attorney who represented Jody Arias and the author of the book series that you need to read, Trapped with Miserius, Kirk Nermy is with us tonight. Okay, I'm not saying it's right or wrong, 
But two people were shot that night, right? An officer was shot. Breonna Taylor was shot and killed. The officer survived. Two people shot. The only person being charged is the person who doesn't shoot anyone. It just seems weird to me. Eklund, what, 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 what is the public supposed to make of this, right? You try to explain what's going on right now at that courthouse. Um, unfortunately, this happens often when I represent certain people, like I represent the kid in the car who didn't do anything and everybody else gets charged, he gets charged as well. So um, this happens often. If I was the defense in, in this case, I would do old school, like the practice, do a plan B, which means that I'm accusing everybody. I am going to be a prosecutor prosecuting the other officers to make my case. So if I was um, defense in this case, I would literally throw everybody under the bus, do a reverse and do it again, because that's the only way to really, really secure a, a win for the officer here. You really do have to throw um, people under the bus. Um, the, the witness who testified, he heard a loud boom. He didn't hear people entering. He didn't hear people knocking on the door saying police. So that can help the defense, meaning that his actions were wanton, everybody else's actions were wanton. So that's just what I would do to throw up the dust of reasonable doubt. Um, I think that the defense does have a chance if they really throw every single other person under the bus. Mima Romani, how, how do we explain this to the public? When, you know, that's this one of my jobs here is to try to explain our system of justice working and sometimes not working, but how do we explain this case where there's a shootout, a police officer gets shot, an innocent person gets shot and killed, and the only person getting charged is the one who didn't shoot anyone, uh, but shot an apartment, shot a wall. Well, Vinny, you can shoot someone and it can be completely lawful, right? I mean, we've seen it with self-defense cases. I don't want to bring up other cases, but look what happened to Kyle Rittenhouse. He shot, killed two people, injured a third, and he walked away. It was self-defense. Or it can be an accident. We're seeing that with Alec Baldwin there in the Rust shooting in New Mexico. In this particular case, the officers that were shot at, one of them was hit, the other returned fire. They lawfully returned fire. They were there executing a search warrant that's their job and all the officers except the officer with the battering ram had the right to return fire but the officer who was outside hankinson is differently situated he shoots 10 rounds essentially blindly he could have killed other officers he could have killed innocent people but for pure luck and the grace of god more people weren't killed so what he did even though ultimately it wasn't fatal was beyond negligence and he needs to be prosecuted the result doesn't matter it's the individual's actions that do Vinny, and that's why we're seeing the charges in this case kirk nermy let me ask you if those 10 rounds that he fires enter brianna taylor he doesn't get charged i would disagree under that circumstance because Depending, well, I guess I should say, depending on exactly where he was located, because we saw Officer Hankinson firing rounds from apparently outside the building, not seeing what he's seeing, that sort of thing. So I think there would be a difference there, Vinny. He could even consider this to be a, a reckless manslaughter under that situation. If he's not knowing what he's shooting at from where he was, then the charges could actually be worse than what they are now for Officer Hankinson. That's interesting. That's interesting. Eklund, do you think that this jury separates this case from Breonna Taylor? Both prosecution defense are saying this is not about Breonna Taylor. This is not about Breonna Taylor. And they keep mentioning her name. Uh, do you think any of the jurors keep her on their mind as they try to ferret through the actions of this officer? Unfortunately, uh, the district attorney in that, in, that, in that case made sure that Breonna Taylor's memory was not going to be in this case, and that's unfortunate. Um, unfortunately, I don't understand why he wasn't charged with felony murder. If they weren't officers, they would have been charged with felony murder because the shooting, uh, as egregious as it was, it was a felony. There was a murder that happened. It's foreseeable that happened. Like. I don't understand um, why they're treating officers differently. The moment he has handcuffs on his hands, then he's a regular citizen and he should have been charged with the litany. I know that this was the only one that was charged, but at least I believe that Breonna Taylor should have gotten justice 
with at least one of the officers because he participated. All right. Day one today. This trial is just beginning. When we come back, we'll take a look at a trial that's beginning to wrap up. We're in the defense case down in Pasco County, Florida. Curtis Reeves claiming self-defense. And today, it was all about his ailments. The defense trying to paint the picture that Curtis Reeves, eight years ago, was a feeble old man.